what is up everybody welcome back to the underdogs podcast we are on to episode four now i think this is four already flying through as always my name is jordan daly with me we got mike taylor craig smith as always and a special guest i'm gonna pass it off to craig to introduce him all right man now i've known this guy through the basketball circle in los angeles been a minute but you're most popularly known for your your roller skills in One Tree Hill. Um, you're also known from Moesha and two very iconic basketball movies of all time. Sun, Sunset Park and Coach Carter. Please help me welcome everybody. Antoine Tanner, bro. Welcome. Welcome, bro. Hey, also, also, one of my favorites I love is uh, Black Jesus. Yeah, love, yeah, 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 Black Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what's up. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah, that was a good one, man. I wish that one could have, I wish we could have did another season of that one. Everybody does. Like, I mean, that was, that was such a really good show. You know what I'm saying? You put, and I don't think it's never been, ever been a show like that, especially with Black Jesus. So, like, just to have these iconic, funny moments, and even think, just the I, the late Charlie Murphy. Yeah, and John Witherspoon. Yeah, and John Witherspoon. John Witherspoon. Right. Yep, yep, yep. That was uh, Aaron Magruder was writing for that too, right? Yeah, but see, that's that's the problem. See, a lot of people don't know what what like really happened. But season one and two was a hit. Well, season one they wanted us to do it. So, but they was like, we don't have a lot of money, but we kind of just want to get it on. So we was like, you know what, we'll do it because we love the idea. So we was like, this is new. I think it, uh, I think it's gonna hit wildfire, whether it be good or bad. We just gonna have some negative press because the Christians was like, what the hell y'all doing? So, so we did it. We took like less money than we would normally take. The second season they bumped us up just a little bit, but like once you get that third season, that's like your syndication year. So. That's when they know they got to pay you. But on Aaron McGruder's shows, he got some kind of ongoing beef with the network. So every time he do a hit show after season two, they decide to try to, <laughs> what they call, make it better. So they are bringing a whole bunch like of new writers. they did with the Boondocks, right? Exactly. They bring in a whole lot of new writers and all this and try to make sure, you know, so-called make it better. But And then they go with, like, a whole new cast and, like, the writing ain't the same, the directing ain't the same, and it just makes it. And so now you don't get the four pickup because they don't want him to get the money. You see what I'm saying? Because now it's contract time. So whatever, whatever he got going on with the studio is the reason why his shows don't last as long as they should. Because he's a, he's an amazing writer. Like he's an amazing. Him and Michael Sandberg, them dudes is amazing. And Slink, like along with them, oh my god! But I, I, that that's some. It's some inner beef going on with him in the studios. So, I mean, they tackle a lot of they tackle a lot of issues that you know what I'm saying. Sometimes be the elephant in our community. You know what I'm saying in our culture. You know what I'm saying. So, I mean, I, I like it. It's, it's 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 very creative and it's just hitting that that underdog type of you know what I'm saying mentality that it takes for us to be successful in anything that we do. Oh yeah. So, yeah, they. But you know, it, it, it definitely is that. But the people they they see they see what he's trying to do, and for whatever reason they don't want him to get that out there. So they just be like, mm, "We'll wait to season three. Oh, we're just gonna change the writers. We'll make it better for you." And the show is always worse. Then they try to call him back later. But with this situation, it was it was too too done. And then with with Pop passing and Charlie passing, it just made it a different show. Yeah, if, unless you went with the original cast, it was going to be a different show. And that's just what it was, season three. I did one episode of season three. But I did all of them one and two. But season three was just different. But, I mean, it's like we, we was attacked from the very beginning. All the Christians was on our page and what the hell are you doing and cussing us out. And we had to go through radio shows and be like, look, man, they was cussing me out like, who are you to say you black Jesus? I was like, nah, I'm the friend. <laughs> it's on me. <laughs> so that was funny. But they, them Christians, they didn't care. But after they saw it, they actually liked it. And they rescinded a bunch of the stuff, like the big mega churches. They was against us, like, right away. 
but they rescinded and was like, we like the message. We see what y'all doing. Okay, we got it. And then they, they actually liked it. So that's, that made us feel good after we got attacked, you know what I'm saying, the very first year. Not a lot of people know that you was a basketball player that turned into an actor. Now, I want you to talk about playing in Chicago before you came to L.A. I want to talk about that experience and then your experience of, of coming to Cali and, and playing. Yeah, I played with some of the, you know, Marcus Liberty, that's my older cousin. So, you know, he was one of the top players in the nation, you know what I'm saying? So, um, he went to King. Went to Illinois. Yeah, I went to Illinois with KG and all of them, you know what I'm saying? Like, Illinois was like, I wanted to go to Illinois when I was younger, wanted to go, wanted to go, but I kept getting in trouble. Because, you know, was, the city is a little different. So, even though we was good players and then you playing King for Coach Cox, you got to... You know, he's taking you under your under his wing, but you still out here getting in trouble. He's selling dope. We gang banging. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what it was to do in the city. And, you know, at that time, it was early 90s. You know what I'm saying? Late 80s, early 90s. So, it was like, and then I ended up coming to California after that. Like, after I got in trouble, my mom was like, you out of here. You going to live with your dad? I'm done. You going to end up in prison or dead? And I was like, she sent me out here. I was hooping. I, I'm going to tell you what's crazy. I met Pops. I met Pops first. I met him and Rock. I met him and Rock at LA City College when they had the. You remember Rockfish? Yeah, Rockfish mm-hmm. tournaments. Yeah, Rockfish and the Pump. I was playing in that, but I was, I was. Dang. See, when I came out here, I played at I played at Rosemead High School, so I was averaging okay. like I was averaging like thirty five out here. But we weren't playing no great schools because the schools never. They wasn't even good at basketball. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. I was like, but I'm from Chicago, so I could play against these I could play against these cats. Like, I'm good. Like I'm going yeah. at them. You know what I'm saying? But out here was just so easy. I'm getting sixty and seventy a game sometime out here. Like it was so easy. So my coach, well, I was working at Ralph's at the grocery store in Duarte, and my coach was like, Hey, it's this tournament I think you want to play in. It's called the Pumps. And they doing it like they do rockfish. And it's at L.A. City College, and I think you should play in it. So I was like, okay, cool. So I, it was 100 bucks. So I'll never forget it was 100 bucks, And I paid the little $100, and I went to play in the tournament. And um, I ended up, I was, in the, I was in the stands, and I seen Pops and Rock when, when they both had black hair. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they was, they was, like, chilling, and uh, Pops was like, hey, um, what time you play? And I was like, I play at 11 because we had the morning games. You know, you had the morning, you had like three yeah. morning games. So I was like, I play at 11. And he was like, what court? And I was like, let me look at the schedule. See, I didn't know. I'm, I was new to L.A. I was, uh, you know, yeah. I paid to play. But in Chicago, I never had to pay. I was always on the team. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But So out here, I didn't know nobody. I was just brand new trying to get my face out here because everybody was like, you playing with Mexicans and Armenians and white boys, <laughs> yeah. you, can't, you can't really hoop. Yeah. You ain't doing that in the city if you come to the city. But I was from the city, just Chicago. So it was yeah. the same, you know. So it was like, and he was like, oh, you play, oh, you on that little Rudy, you probably on one of them little Rudy Pooh teams. We're going to probably beat y'all by 50. And I said, what? Mm. I said, man, don't nobody never tell me they're going to just beat me by 50. And so Pop started laughing like I like his confidence. I was like, hell yeah, yeah. who tells somebody you're going to beat them by 50? I got 27 scholarship players. They all signed D1. You know, Rock. That's how he was talking. Yeah. I like, yeah. I don't give a right. damn. He can't guard me. I don't care where he's going. He can't stop me. I ain't saying I can lock him up, but he ain't locking me up. I can tell you that. And Rock was like, okay, we'll see. I was like, yeah, we will. So Pops was just laughing. So when the game started, they had Tess. You know Tess. They had Tess Whitlock, most Bills. Tracy Aqua, they had all oh, Kevin Bill, they had all of them cats. Like, and uh, at the time, them cats was big names in LA. You know what I'm saying? Like, far as on yeah. the scene. But we all was the same age. Man, I had 11 threes. And so after the game, and I just kept hearing Coach Rock go, because me and him was talking shit to each other. He just kept going, Who got him? Who got him? You smack the floor, you get up in him. He's sorry. And they were, and they kept saying his shot is so fast, Coach. We trying to get to it, but it don't. It looked like he's scared, like he just throwing it at the rim, but it, it just keeps going in. So he was like, so after the game, they beat us by like fourteen, but he said they was gonna beat us by fifty. But my team was sorry, we all paid to play. 
they would just put five five players in for the first ten minutes, then sub five, mm-hmm. so everybody got equal time. And you know what I'm saying? Because we wasn't really a premier team, so you know. So so the next morning, I went and played my my next game. Pops and Rock, they they watched it because they had played right after us. Then I caught the bus back home. I lived in El Monte. You know what I'm saying? I didn't even have a ride up to L.A. City. And so the next morning, I was I was running late because I had got off the bus. So I was trying to get to my game. And, you know, you had to – well, you probably didn't have to do it, but I had to sign in for the uniform, you know, because we had to turn it in at the end of the day. So I ran in. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was signing in. I was like, hey, um, because I see my team warming up, but I didn't see my name on the list. So I'm like, ma'am, listen – um, I play right now. I need to get my uniform. She was like, well, what team you on? I was like, I'm on team select. So that means we paid. <laughs> but I didn't know. Yeah. And so um, she was like, nah, I don't see you on the list. I said, ma'am, I paid $100. I played yesterday. And I played three games yesterday. My name got to be on the list. I'm looking at my teammates warming up. I just need my jersey. So, you know, we about to start. Yeah. So she was like, I can't give you a jersey if I don't see your name on it. So Rock and Pops then walked in. And, um... And so I was like, Coach, could you do me a favor? I said, could you tell this lady I played for Team Select because I played y'all yesterday? And he was like, wow, what time she saying you playing? I said, man, we play right now, like five minutes. He's like, you don't play right now. I said, I do play right now. And so he was like, nah, you play next. You, I can, come on. So they, they put me on. That's how I got on. That's how I met them. Word. Yeah, pop and rock. So that's how I started getting to the city. That's how I played in because I played in Drew and, and like I've been playing in Drew since '92. Yeah, since '92, I still got that's old. Class. I still got old yeah. performance from Drew in '92. That's it. <sighs> yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna have to at some point I'm gonna have to ask you who was who was the favorite team in the Drew that you was on. Like, what was your favorite season of that? Well, since you got such a long career, like, damn. I've been I didn't a, even know that. I, I played. In, I only played in one championship in the Drew, and that was 2012. We lost to um, well, the, at, they were LA Unified, but before they was LA Unified, they was um, Pro Top Prospects. Yeah, TPI. Yeah, we lost to them in the championship with uh, LB and all them. Yeah, Bobby Brown. Uh, was James playing then? Yep, James. They cheated us yeah. in the championship. Bobo, Bobo, Go tended, he, Bobo Go tended the shot, <laughs> and they didn't call it, so everybody stopped because they thought he was going. They was going to call Go and they kicked it yeah, down, and, they, and he laid the ball up. <laughs> we was like Red laid, Big Red laid the ball up. We was like, hold on, man, that's Go tended. <laughs> And they was like, nah, man. we was like, oh, they cheated us. They, they took it from us in, in 2012. But I, that's what happened I, when you play guys from Westchester. Yeah, yeah, they cheated. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. You can't play LA. You can't play no LA team, and we ain't from LA, so they're not rolling with that. Yeah, man. Let's talk. Let's talk about uh, Pasadena, Pasadena City College. Well, Pasadena was was different because I originally was supposed to go to DePaul. But they had found out that I had did the movie. But I did the movie on the off season. Like nobody really believed me. So um they was like, nah, you you can't, you know, the NC two A, they gotta investigate to make sure you didn't get paid to play. So it was like, so now you're gonna have to go sit out until they do like this appeal. And so but you could play junior college and you know that way you can stay in shape. So if you do get your scholarship, you know what I'm saying, they do decide to offer you the scholarship, you could go back and play. But coach was like, cool, I'll, I'll make it to where you could, like, have a red shirt year. You know what I'm saying? He could put me under my name for, like, yeah. seven games, I yeah. think it was. Yeah. And then I could play under somebody else's name. Like, they was going to look out for me because they knew what was happening. So I was just like, damn. But So I ended up going to, I just ended up going to PCC and then – um. After PCC, I hooked up back up with Pops, and I hooked up with Cheeky. You remember Cheeky, the little Filipino that used to come to the to the gym. He was he started being an agent. He used to work with Pops all the time. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cheeky started getting me out the country, like Tahiti, Korea, France. Like Cheeky would get me out of, out of there to, to play. So I went over there and played for a while, and then I just came home after that. And I, I played in the ABA when they first started, like when Cats was really getting some help. Yeah. I was playing the ABA then because it was local and I didn't have to, you know, going over, everybody, I know going overseas is lonely as hell. 
when you got bad kids. So it was like, I had to make sure I was like, nah, I'm, I got to do this family thing. And then after that, I booked the show. So I couldn't even stay over there no more. So it was just like back and forth. But I still play right now. I still play in the ABA. We actually play Sunday in San Jose. Nice. Yeah, I'm still playing. So I'm just. I love it, dog. I love it. Yeah, just staying in shape right now. But I love watching y'all play. You and Mike, y'all some hogs. I, I promise y'all love watching y'all, especially Mike, because he was a guard. You, you, you was a bully. You know what I'm saying? You was just a bully. You know what I'm saying? But you played with some crazy cats because you was you was when uh, AP right? AP one. Yeah, but I was with AP. Um, who else did I play for? Yeah, it was AP one, AP two. When we had me, Keith Claus, yeah, yeah, Claus, uh, D'Angelo was on y'all Rip, team, crazy as D'Angelo. D'Angelo. <laughs> yeah, y'all had a crazy squad. And Williams went to West West LA. Yep. So for yeah, the, I remember I watched a lot of y'all battles. For those people that are listening, this is the first time the Drew League's brought up in this podcast. Do you guys want to explain like what the Drew League is and how it's different from like, other basketball leagues? Yeah, the Drew is the biggest. Yeah, the big. It's like the biggest. It's the biggest oh, pro wow. league in the world. I I say we didn't. The Drew actually didn't get a whole lot of pub, and I have been telling Dino for years. Like Dino, you got a really good product, man. You just got to know how to market it. Like, cause yeah, yeah. I done played in the Dykeman. I done played, you know what I'm saying? I done played in the one in Chicago. And Golly, yeah. yeah, but it ain't like the celebrities that come through in Chicago ain't the same celebrities that come through out here. So it's a it's a different magnitude. You know what I'm saying? He was just like, yeah, but they didn't they didn't really have the right marketing at the time. But when game came to the league, he blew the league up because he had the he had the marketing because he, Twitter was huge back then. And he would just drop an address, but he had millions of followers, and everybody would just show up. And he was like, damn, where all these people come from? We never had, like, like the gym would be packed, but we knew everybody. It was, like, more like family back then. Like, we knew everybody. So it was, like, the family from the other teammates from other teams. Like, that's who it was. But but once he did it, it looked like an NBA game. We had hoochie mamas from everywhere, just fans, like, <laughs> all kind of racist because it was just really black in that neighborhood you know what I'm saying we in South Central but then it was everything it was Asian kids and white kids and they was getting out of cabs and we was like what the hell like it because it was free and you get to watch KD and all these new these new celebs like play for free and you that close then Cole like like once it finally got the, the notoriety out Cole came and played Brian came and played that was like that was Man. different it was different. They put it on the map like a whole different way. Cause I think Los Angeles or California got the second highest. Is they might even have the first highest. I know it's I know it's L.A., Chicago, New York. I don't know in which order, but they got the most NBA players. And a lot of the cats like in L.A. They all work out together at like Rico at his like the open runs and all of that. So. All them cats is here. Yeah, all them cats is here already, and they just wanted to go. But like, I knew, you know, that's what's crazy because I never forget when I met Baron. I met Baron in the Drew. He was in eighth grade, and he ripped me three times because I was playing with the ball. I was like, and he ripped me and went and like windmilled, and I was like, who the hell is this kid? <laughs> I don't know who he was, but he was talking to me like, I'm gonna take that. I'm gonna take that. I was like, man, move. And he took it. It was like lightning speed. I was like, damn. I was like, this little kid going to be all right. They was like, that's Baron Davis. I was like, who is that? I don't know who that is. They was like, he's going to crossroads next year. And I was like, I'm going to go check him out. Yeah, he was a beast. I met a lot of players in the Drew. Like, but I was, and I was older than them. Like, yeah. Sean and, and um, Russ used to be up there all the time. And Tommy, like, a lot of people forget about Tommy, Tayshawn, older brother, TP. Yeah, I like man. I was like, I played with some hogs up there, but it's like it was more family like back then. Now it's more Hollywood. It's way more Hollywood right now, but it was. But back then, it was just grind out battles. Like the atmosphere is different. Like you could say New York. New York is good. Don't get me wrong. New York is good. They got the the announcer on the thing, and uh, but George is a different announcer. He like. He like dry. He, nice. He's not a personable person. Where he ain't, yeah. You know he ain't cracking jokes. Like they cracking jokes. They getting the crowd hype. 
he just basically like, if you ain't got no game, you gonna know about it right then. Like, it, it's it's a different atmosphere to play in the Drew than to even play college basketball. It's a different atmosphere. That 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 that's so tense. If you can't handle that pressure, you can't play. Yeah, you can't play if you can't handle that pressure. Yeah, I like it. That 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 Julie, that Julie is definitely something different. And then for me, it's way different too, because they always see. A lot of people don't know that I was hooping first, and then I ended up getting I ended up getting in the movies because we was playing at the Say No that day, and um, like I said, Rock and Pops is like my big brother and my you know and my dad. You know what I'm saying? So, but we was playing, and me and Rock was talking shit to each other on the sideline. Cause we have, cause Pops had two teams. So Rock, that's when they branched out to two teams. They had the the Panthers and the Jaguars. And so what they would do is they um, we had played on separate teams, and me and Rock always talked shit to each other. And he was like, "Who got him?" And I'm like, "Ain't nobody got me. I'm open all the time. You you know, sub these cats." And and a, a coach on the sideline saw that and thought I was being disrespectful. And told me somebody was going to lock me up the next day, and it never happened. But after the game, he ended up telling me to come audition for for um, Sunset Park. And that's how I got on. Like, I went and auditioned for the movie, and I booked the movie. Like, And I was like, damn, I got a movie. <laughs> so nobody believed me. But when they, when they heard that I did it, that's when the NC2A got hold of that and was like, that's, that's getting paid to play basketball. And I was like, no, I got paid to act. I didn't get paid to play basketball. So I had to go through the whole little appeal process. But by that time, my career was already rolling. So it was kind of like, I know I could still play. I could play whenever. So so let, let me ask you this. With the way college rules are set up now with the new NIL and now players can profit off their own name, if that was like that back when you were going through it all, do you think you still would have tried to play like college basketball at the same time? Play at the level. I could definitely play at the level. It's just the now I would have been so marketable, but you know, back then we didn't have social media. So like, I look at some of the younger kids now, like the Hezzy God and the White Iversons, all the ballers' life. You know what I'm saying? Like, if they had that when we was coming up, man, we'd have been paid, paid, paid. Because the cats that I'm looking at, like Craig and, and Mike, them they could actually play. These cats went to college and never got a minute. You know what I'm saying at a ju- at a JUCO, you know what I'm saying they 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 been playing, but now they got fifty thousand, a hundred thousand followers, and they able to make ten thousand a month because they a brand because they got people that's just gonna follow it and endorsers that's gonna get behind it. They they didn't get behind us like that. If you wasn't the biggest name, they wasn't rocking with you, and you could be way better than the the name that they rocking with. Because I done seen you might kill some cats, and I'm like. He, man, he underrated. Like, I've seen, I'm telling you, I've seen it. So that's why I'm just like, damn, like, that's crazy. But now it's, that's the way of the world. It's everything is marketing, like OnlyFans, like all of that, like, the avenues for people to get streams of income. And they, I mean, the young, I'm, they taking advantage of it. So, I mean, I can't hate. But if, if, if they'd have had this opportunity to me, psh. man, that's what I was just saying. It's about that opportunity, like, it's, and they don't even understand it because they the ones who growing up in it. So they don't really get to see it from our point of view. Like, if we had these opportunities like this, it'd be like, it's, that's multiple sources right there. That's multiple streams of income right there. You know what I'm saying? Like, we was we was pigeonholed into, you know what I'm saying, one lane. The NBA for um, you or overseas, there wasn't no G League back then. None of that. You know what I'm saying? So if you wasn't signing and then you going to certain None countries where they only giving you two thousand a month and then you gotta work your way up and you like you there you still need a job. It's like you know what I'm saying, but a lot of cats don't understand that, you know what I'm saying? So it's like it's just different, but that is yeah, that's, well, hell yeah, I th- I would have made a lot of money if they'd have had social media back then because Sunset Park was huge. And, and I had I had a lot of haters because yeah, I promise sure. you, and I'm still to this day. I walk in the gym at Drew, and they didn't understand that this is how I got the movie because I was playing. I was killing up here. That's why somebody told me to come to the audition. But then you <laughs> play against the kids that watch it and be like, oh, he an actor. He can't hoop. I'm going at him. And you know what I'm saying? And then 25 points later, 
I ain't really know he could play. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, like this was my stepping stone. Like this is how I started, but they don't get it. You know what I'm saying? It's just, but the social media is like way different right now. I mean, I like it because it's, I like it. Like the kid, but, but it, it damn so get, make a lot of people big headed because I went to a club one time recently and it was these, not YouTubers, they was uh, TikTokers. I didn't know who they was. My wife lives on TikTok. I didn't know who the hell they was because I, I I just just got an account. But um, they were so Hollywood. Like, yeah, man, it's cool. It's cool. Peace. You know what I'm like? They were so Hollywood. I was just like... <laughs> yeah, it was hilarious. But yeah, the social media wave, man, I blew everything up now. That's crazy. So you're still hooping. It sounds like you're ty- it's time to like make a, make a move to the big thing. Hell no. Nah, they're not fucking with me. They ain't look at my resume. They ain't gonna do it. I, I I think it's some other players they should give a chance to, but they ain't giving them a chance. I'm like, damn. See, like Bone Collector, people would like to watch BC play. I think they would like to watch him play, but he ain't gonna get the opportunity because he don't got the 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 politics behind him. You know what I'm saying? To, to ride that, like Frank Nitty, he got he had the politics behind him because the social media. You got so many people vouching for him like he need to get in he need to get in he need to get in but there's other players out there that's just as good that won't get that opportunity because they don't have the social media you know what i'm saying but he should have been given a chance i, I applaud i'm so happy for little bro he been given a chance but it's it's a few other cats out there that i think they should have gave that look to because i guarantee you right now bc cats would like to watch him play because really the big three is it ain't really a team sport at that it's one-on-one and he one of the best one on one players. Like he walks and shoots layups. Like once he once he cross you, it's over. He he gonna lay it up. So there ain't too many people that's guarding him without help. They gonna call help. That's for sure. Like I've never seen nothing like his crossover. Yeah, his hezzy. Oh my god, I've never like seen nobody that, with with a hezzy as quick as he is. And you know it's coming. That's the crazy part. You know it's coming. It's going left. You know it's coming. He's still going. <laughs> but I don't know him as Bone Collector. I know him as Speedy. He was ten years old. Used to be in my house eating up all my snacks. You know what I'm saying? Because he's from Pasadena. And I, when I moved out here, that's where I, I, I lived in Pasadena. So him and, and Sick with it. Well, Rob K. Him and Sick with it, and and Spin Master. He home them like my my little brothers. You know what I'm saying? So they, they used to be at my house all the time. Yeah. Did Bone Collector always have a, a do rag on his head when you? He never took that thing off. We used to be like, I don't think he liked his hairline or something because he kept it on. <laughs> he was like, well, you can't go to the prime with a do-rag. Oh, come on, bro. I'm, I got a different kind that I'm going to wear. Like, he always had that thing on. He's like, too. Right. Yeah, for the information to know, like, sick with and bone collector are big and one pieces. Like, he used to do and one mixtape. Like, those two really, really big time as far as basketball movement and for them to be your little bros like hey like do you just dropping something ever yeah well sick with it older than me and bone younger and um spin master e holmes they he younger but but um sick is older than us so he like the big bro you know what I'm saying? but he but all three of them they could actually play organized ball too and then they could do the, they could do the yeah. tricks but but I promise you, Bone was throwing it through people's legs at a 10, 11 years old. He was already doing that. And I remember Coach Coach Rocky Moore was at Pasadena at the time. And he was like, hey, you better stop doing that shit. It's not going to work in a game. No coach is going to play you. He went to Chafee. He was playing at Chafee with Tarkanian. And uh, yeah. they, they played it. It was a holiday tournament at, at Pasadena. And they tried to 2 2 1 press him. And he said, go, go. He told his teammates to go, and the coach is like, just pass the ball. He's like, go. Dude stepped up on him. He <laughs> threw it through his legs, yanked him, looked at him, went spin move, heavy the other dude, walked across like, man, they can't press me, coach. I know. I was like, damn. Like, he embarrassed the hell out of them, like, for their presence. And the coach was like, Two three zone. <laughs> he just backed up and ran the zone because they couldn't go man. Yeah. They couldn't go man against him. 
They couldn't do it. I was like, damn. And so coach was like, I didn't think that shit was going to work in the game. It's not going to work all the time. I said, coach, he done did sure. it like seven times. He definitely this got the game. game. It's yeah. work. He hadn't turned the ball over once. <laughs> so, you, yeah, I, I want to see BC get in. If anybody get in, I want to see him get in. All right, so we'll move on from, you know, your basketball. It sounded like you got into acting through your basketball. Yes, sir. Um, it sounds like you got scouted kind of for that role when you were playing. Um, after Sunset Park, you get cast in One Tree Hill. You were, the, I believe, one of four in that show to make it from the pilot yep. to the finale, right? Yep. So yeah. It's, it's crazy. Did Chad make it to the finale? Chad was in the finale. He, okay. he was at the airport scene. Yeah, Chad did make it to the finale. Hillary didn't make it to the finale, but all of us made it to the finale. Yeah, that's right. So, they do the pilot and the finale. What was the the casting like for that? Like, how did that come apart for you? By that time, I had already been in the game for a while. So I had a lot of projects under my belt. But Mike Tolan and Brian Robbins and Mark, Mark Schwann was the creators and Joe DeVola, they all was the creators of the show. And um, we, I had actually worked with them prior to One Tree Hill and Coach Carter because, you know, that was the same producers. So I ended up, um, we did a, it was a basketball pilot for TV that was kind of supposed to be like, you know, it was like about college, about college hoops and it was called Slam. And that was a pilot that we shot, but it didn't get picked up. So they already kind of knew me. So I was kind of like down with them doing projects. I did another project with Brian called uh, Four Points with Shaquille O'Neal and Cheryl Miller. And um, it was an after-school special, but it was about basketball. And um, they was like, man, we got this pilot. Twan, you want to do this pilot? I was like, yeah, let's do the pilot. So we did the pilot. Didn't get picked up. So they was like, we going to find something, man. We going to find something. So when One Tree Hill came about, it was called um, A Book of Ravens. That's what it was called originally. And they called me in for the audition. And I walked in, but... Them was my boys. They already had my back because we had already been through the trenches on a couple projects that didn't go. So they was just like, when we do get something that's going to that's gonna finally stick, we're going to call you. I was like, all right, bet. So when I went in, I was ready to audition. And we just talking about basketball. And then they was like, man, we got to go. We'll see you in a couple weeks. We want to know Carolina to film. I was like, all right, bet. So it was like, it was my audition process was different because we already had history with the cats. You know what I'm saying? So that was a real, like, Easy transition. We went down there, shot it. Once it got picked up, it was like, damn, we actually got picked up. We finally had something that was going, but then we had scandal at the end of season one with Chad marrying one of the cast members, and he cheated on her with Paris Hilton, and and it was all over the tabloids. But for black dudes, if we did that, we fired. You know what I'm saying? But a white boy, and he was cute, and he did it. We got another season. <laughs> so, <laughs> we got another season. And so I was like, damn. I said, okay, I see what's going on. We got cute white boys. We got real pretty uh, white girl. And as long as y'all keep all this scandal, man, we going to stay on TV. I'm the only black dude on the show. Y'all going to keep me a check. I appreciate it. <laughs> so, that's what happened. But that's family, though. Everybody doing their right. thing now. So I'm proud of everybody that was on the show. I mean, that was like almost a decade of your life right there. Um, yeah, nine like, years. What, what was like, yeah, what was that What was that situation like for you? You know what I'm saying? Like, how did you grow as a person? Like, what, what was you able to, like, take some of the qualities from some of the some of the cast members? Because, like I'm saying, like, 10 years, that's a long, that's a long time. Well, it, I think it would have been different if I would have filmed it in L.A., but we filmed in Wilmington, North Carolina. So at the time, nothing was going on in Wilmington. Wilmington is a small little town. It was kind of boring. And, and I didn't drink or smoke or nothing. You know what I'm saying? So I couldn't really indulge in what everybody else had going on. So the first couple of years, I was just out there bored. But you focused on work because you didn't have all the the stuff that goes on in L.A. Like you could go to the club. It had the girls. You had the celebrity. You, it's it's easy to get details. I, it's, L.A. is the hardest place to to focus. If you, like, whether you play in the NBA, the NFL, anybody that come to L.A., 
it's a whole different focus. They go somewhere else, they can focus and flourish on what it is they came to do. But in L.A., it's a whole different town. So we was all stuck in Wilmington, and we just all became like family because there was nothing to do. So we would go to each other's house for dinner after we worked or go hang out over here or go hang out over there. So it, we became a family, like, really, after 10 years. Like, I still talk to all of them people to this day, like, every day, just about. But it was a real good experience, though. But then they had me do um, Mark Swan wrote Coach Carter after, like, I think it was, like, season three. Like, it was, like, right around season three, season four. Then they was like, okay, Twan, listen, we got this basketball movie, and it's going to be big. We got Samuel Jackson starring in it, and um, we want you to be a part of it. But you're going to have to go through the audition process. I was like, okay, that's cool. So I went through the audition process. And then they, um, I had a really small role at first because Worm was small. Like, I probably said something in one scene, and you just saw me in other scenes. This was the original script. So I was like, okay. And when we got to filming, well, before we actually got to film, we had a table read. And the shit was not funny. It was not funny at all. It was like, it was so dead the first. So Sam was like, oh, shit. Niggas' jobs ain't safe in here. Like, <laughs> so we was just like, so Mike and Brian came to me and was like, okay, Twan, look, because they know I have a way that I do my acting thing. I never really read the script. I just read my portion, find out what's going on, and then that's it. I study for me, and then I watch the whole, like, when the, when the project is done, I watch the entire project because I want to be a fan. I don't want to watch it like I'm critiquing every little thing, you know what I'm saying, that we're doing. Because you don't really get to enjoy it the same once you're actually in it. And so um, I was just like, man, I was like, I can't. He was like, he was like, Twan, listen, man, we need to rewrite the script. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to add some more stuff. And we got a table read again tomorrow. He's like, please, I need you to just focus on this work. I said, man, I got you. I got you. And he was like, all right. So they rewrote the script. So the next day when I came to the table read, we I had a whole bunch of stuff now. So it was like other stuff that they had for other players that was saying it the day before it had my name on it now. So I was like, cause I only had the one scene and the one scene I did was funny as hell. And they just left it alone. It was the, the two for one special. You know what I'm saying? I had to laugh and everything and they just loved it. But then they never heard nothing from worm no more. So the next day they changed it. I had all these different storylines now. And when I did it, Sam was like, I think we picked up now. You ain't got to worry about it no more. We good. So they gave me all these different stories <laughs> the night before, and I made it funny. You know what I'm saying? So the producers was more happy to be, okay, cool, we're going to go with him. Because I was really number, I think, nine on the call sheet at first. I was number nine, and I ended up being number two once they, once they switched everything up. But they knew they could come to me. It's just like when you hoop and I'm on a break, I, I got a finisher over here, and I got a dude who I don't know going to fit. You always going to pass it to the finisher. You know what I'm saying? Even if he missed, he may have been more wide open. But you're going to give it to the finisher because, you know, nine times out of ten, you're going to get a bucket. With him, you don't really know. And that's how the situation was with, with the movie at the time. They didn't know where they was going to go because that first table read was horrible. I'm telling you, it was, it was so quiet in the table read. <laughs> I was like, damn, the only scene was funny was mine. That's the only time they laughed. But it was quick. And then I was just turning the page with everybody else, just letting everybody else read. But the next day it was all it was lights, camera, and action. And we got it done after that. So that was that was a really good experience. One of the best the best times I ever had filming was Coach Carter. We will get more into Coach Carter later on, but we're gonna jump back to One Tree Hill first. Specifically filming One Tree Hill and the basketball moments, you know, you obviously have a lot of experience with basketball at this point. Did any of the other cast kind of have a handle on, you know, basketball to the level you had? Um, what was, like, filming for these basketball moments like within that show? And were you kind of able to, like, contribute ideas um, when they were, like, writing these storylines for, like, the specific basketball moments? Probably, you know, you knowing you had the most knowledge. Yeah, well, um, James Lafferty actually played. He played in high school. I think he was at, like, Hemet High School. A, a lot of the cats that was around there, what they did was they hired a lot of local cats from North Carolina that actually played. 
You know what I'm saying? And they, they was, like, really good out there. A lot of them cats played at Laney, where Michael Jordan went to school at. Um, and actually, Michael Jordan isn't even even the all-time leading scorer. It's a dude named Jabari. Um, what is that? Uh, Jabari. I can't remember his last name. But uh, I think it's Kelly. Jabari Kelly. Like, he was the all-time leading scorer at, at Laney because he, he played four years varsity. But all of those cats was actually the other players that were on the One Tree Hill team. You know what I'm saying? So there's a lot of local guys that actually could really get down. So, because Chad Michael Murray couldn't play basketball. He's a football player, quarterback. But they had a dude named Van, who was his who was his stunt double. And Van was a beast. White boy could play. I mean, had hops, everything. The white boy could play. So I wasn't actually the only one there with a whole lot of knowledge about the game. It was a lot of cats there. Like, we were really, like, when they yell cut, we would go up and down. It would, be, it would be some battles, some fights, and all that. You know what I'm saying? So on set. So, but um, they had geared it towards basketball, which got a whole lot of basketball like fans. And then they went back to the drama. You know, what I'm saying to keep the young girls crying and oh my god, we well, you know. And then they tackled a lot of issues and, but the basketball was definitely a big a big factor in it. And like I said, but James Lafferty was the only one on the cast that could really play like that. And then all the rest of them, them guys were just local cats that just, they was getting a check every day for coming to be on the team. And then they was on TV and they got a chance to, you know, to, to make some money and, you know, and local cause they wasn't doing nothing. Cause when I'm telling you Wilmington, I watched Wilmington grow up. Everything used to close at like five or six o'clock. It was the country. If you didn't get what you needed to get by six, you didn't get it. The everything was closed. The whole town shut down. But like now, it's like a it's a city now. You know what I'm saying? It's not a big, big city, but it's 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 a big city compared to the other little towns out there because it's still you know it's still North Carolina. It's still rural areas out there. It's still the country. But yeah. Did you have like a a favorite episode or like a favorite memory from the uh, from when you was filming? I think one of my favorite episodes was the state championship just because that, like, I mean, you kind of know what that feel like. I never played in a state championship in high school. I always made it to the semi. Paul Pierce beat us. Charles O'Bannon beat us. Like, you know, both years that I played, you know what I'm saying? Like, I couldn't get past them guys, but it was always, I always got, like, the game right before the the, the chip to go. You know what I'm saying? So I never actually played in one. So that was kind of like, it brought back a lot of memories. Like, you know, the arena was full and you playing and everybody here to see you play. And you know what I'm saying? So that was kind of one that was like, I felt like, then we actually, we won. I felt like I actually won, but I really didn't. It was a TV, <laughs> but I felt like I won. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but that, that was a really good episode because it covered a whole lot of stuff. And, um, Another one that I really liked was the school shooting. Once I finally watched the entire ep- once I finally watched the entire episode, because I, like I said, I never really read the scripts. But once I saw that one, I was like, "Damn, we tackled an issue that ended up happening years later, and was it was still happening." You know what I'm saying? Like, so we was tackling a lot of issues way before the time, you know what I'm saying, before the time comes, because that's what the kids was dealing with. And uh, the writer was one of those kids, depressed, sad, not ex- really accepted. He wasn't really like a, a big jock or nothing like that. He was a little quirky-looking dude who probably never really got girls. And you know what I'm saying? So the girls that he wrote about was girls he wanted to be with. And so that's what made the character Mouth. Mouth was really the creator. So, cause I, you know, it's funny cause we make jokes about it all the time at the conventions and I say, I say, damn, Mouse kissed every girl on the show. And then I said, damn, he even kissed my girl because he did an episode. So, so <laughs> it was crazy, but yeah, One Tree Hill was, it was, it was different. It was a chunk out of our life. Like I said, everybody became a family. The show became huge. And then what's, what's even crazier is the show been off the air since 2012. That's 10 years we've been off the air. We get new fans every year because they binge watch it. 
So it's funny because I be meeting girls now. I'm 46, but I meet girls now like 16. was like, oh, my God, I didn't know you had kids. And I'm like, you wasn't watching One Tree Hill when it was on. Like, you was two. Like, you know what I'm There's no way you was watching One Tree Hill when you were two. You was watching, like, Dora the Explorer or Blue's Clues. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, what the hell? And they were like, no. I started watching, and I binged it. And I watched it three times already. And you like, damn. I've only seen seven episodes myself. I, really? I got all the box sets, but I only, I've only seen seven episodes. Because I, I, you know. Do you think you'll ever watch it all? I think I will. Well, you know, it's just sometimes when you don't got no time, you just kind of like. And I don't even really watch a lot of stuff that I'm on because I, it's like, this is what a lot of people don't get. I understand. It's, a, it's a job. It's a job for us. So when you leave your job, you don't care what happens at the job. <laughs> the job is over. The job is done. I'm chilling now. I got paid already. Yeah, so you don't you don't watch it, and then I think we didn't really watch it at the time because usually when the show came on, we was actually filming. We was filming the next episode when that one was coming on. It was just at the at work the next day. We just wanted to see what the ratings were. You know, oh, we did three point seven million. Cool. All right, we good. Nobody really cared. I, I know my day at One Tree Hill when I went to work. It was if I had an early call time, I'm trying to get done by like four o'clock. No later than four. If I could get whatever scenes I got to get, I'm hoping I shoot early because I had a schedule. I would go to work, go get something to eat, and I'm going straight to the gym because they hooped at UNCW. It was open runs at UNCW every day at like 5 o'clock. So we'll go hoop from like 5 to like 8, lift. I come back, get some food, chill for a little bit, watch a game or something, and we was going to the bar because that was all to do. It was nothing else to do in North Carolina. That was it. You went to the gym or you went to the bar. So I go to the gym, I go to the bar, and I get up and go to work. And then when I ain't had time, I come back to California and come see my family. That was it. But it took that was I did that for nine years. Is it crazy to you like how relevant it still is today? Like ten years off air now? Yeah, it's, it's way crazy because that's what I'm saying. We got more fans now because YouTube and and um with Netflix and Hulu by them like buying the shows and putting the shows on and just giving all these kids an opportunity to binge it. We just get the fan base continues to grow because it's, it's an addictive show and it covers a lot of topics. So by being an addictive show, these kids, that's what I'm saying. Now, the fan base is getting younger and younger every year when I know they didn't watch this. this they, there's no way possible they could have watched the show when it was on because they was too young. But now they know everything about all of it. It's just funny because they look at my social media and I post a picture of my son who just turned 21. And they like, oh, my God, Skills has kids? And I'm like, they older than you. <laughs> so it's just weird. But, I mean, it's self-gratifying -grat it, it, because you like, that's what's up. You know what I'm saying? They let you know you you made a classic. And people going to remember it forever. So that's cool. You could be dead and gone, but people still going to remember Coach Carter, they still gonna remember Sunset Park. They still gonna remember Moesha. They still gonna remember One Tree Hill. One, you know, what I'm saying? they still gonna remember that. So I done etched myself in history some way. You know what I'm saying? Because we just had the anniversary yeah. for Coach Carter was the other day on the um, what was it, 13th, and uh, that was 17 years ago when that movie came out. Wow. It's one of the best basketball movies of all time. Yeah, all you know, right. yeah, Definitely. it's one of the best. So. I mean, I'm glad to be a part of the history. You know what I'm saying? We didn't think it was going to be that big, but it was. You know, so that's cool for me. I'm working on new stuff, you know, now trying to branch out and get my foot in the door on the producing side, directing side. You know what I'm saying? So, but I got a, a good show, that two two good shows that I did. One is called Ho with, uh, yep, you know, yep. Miko, with Miko Grimes. So yeah, Miko produced this. So um, I play her husband on the show. It's like a woman's standpoint of view. That's gonna be a really good one. A lot of women love that. They're gonna love that show, but they're gonna hate me. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, they gonna hate me. But you know, sis did her thing. I'm proud of her. And then uh, you got uh, another one that I did called Mad World. I have to send that. I'm gonna send you the link to that, Craig. Y'all can check it out. And you know what I'm saying? It's um, 
we trying to sell that show right now because that's going to be a good one too. And I play the abuse, I play an abusive drunk dad, you know what I'm saying? Who was a pimp in Compton, but it's a true story, but it's going to be a show. It's going to be a series. So we looking for like, you know, either we, either we going to sell it to a network or we going to find local investors and we're going to shoot it and then sell it to the network because we'll kill them. You know, we yeah. could get the money from it. The show is actually good. But I've been working on a whole lot of stuff since since One Trio ended. I done did so much stuff, you know, because a lot of people are like, yo, you still working? I'm like, you got to change the channel. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't just do black black stuff. <laughs> I, do, I do a whole lot of different stuff. I like that. Yeah, man, your IMD page is loaded with stuff you've done between producing and yeah. directing. It's all there, but to close out on your One Tree Hill chapter, is there a dream storyline you wish your character had that you didn't get? I wanted to I wanted to make love to so Sophia Bush's character one time. But they wouldn't do it. They didn't want the drama. <laughs> ah, that would have been a good one. Yeah. That would have been fun. Yeah, too. Sophia that's that's like my sister, but we always joked. I used to be like, I want a brook brook because there, there was this, I'll go brook yourself. And I'd be like, I want to brook brook too. What's happening? And they would never do it. <laughs> so we kept so we, we kept it on going like we wanted to do it because just to see if they would write it, but they never wrote it. <laughs> they just was like, yeah, whatever. Y'all go ahead. Maybe in the reunion. So 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 going back on that, like that, that last question just a little bit, like was there any role that you almost got but you didn't get, like, something happened that you like wish you would have had like any like other movies that you was like I auditioned for that like I wish I would have had that this would have been my role in that movie type of situation you know what I'm talking about I did actually I went from having two jobs to no jobs in eight hours it was the craziest like <laughs> at the time I was filming um sister sister <clears throat> you know the tv show <laughs> with the twins and uh with Tia and Tamara and I um auditioned for it was called The Corner. I don't know if you remember The Corner, but The Corner was a prequel to The Wire. Wow. So, yeah, the, the, go back and look it up. Sean T. Nelson did it. Um, it was me and Sean T. Nelson that tested for The, the Corner. Eileen McKnight was the casting director. And then Denzel was directing Friday Night Lights. So it was his first, it was his directorial debut. So I was like, damn, this is a mini series. And back then, like mini series weren't really cracking like movies was. So I was like, damn. So I auditioned for Friday Night Lights. So I got close. So it was like, it was down to me and Donald Faison for Friday Night Lights. And it was me and Shanti that uh, to the finals down for the corner. But it was a conflict because they were filming at the same time. So I would have the lead to go to Baltimore the next day to start shooting in like three or four days. And if I would have booked Remember the Titans, I would have had to go down south. I think it was Louisiana. We had to go to Louisiana for training camp for football to get ready to film. So I was like, damn. So everybody was like, well, what do you want to do? This is going to be a Jerry Bruckheimer movie. And this is going to be something Charles Dutton is doing, which Charles was big, but he wasn't big like Denzel, you know what I'm saying, at the time. So it was like, what choice are you going to make? And I was like, well, what choice am I? So at the time, I was told your first choice on the corner and your first choice with Denzel. But you gotta, you can't sign your contract until in the morning. So I was like, huh. So me and my agent that was thinking, so Eileen McKnight, she ended up calling over to Jerry Bruckheimer's and was like, so look, what position is Antoine in? And they were, because we need to make our offer today because we, we have to get them on a the plane in the morning. And so they was like, well, right now he's number one. So I was like, if they said I'm number one, then I'm going to take the movie. I ain't going to do the miniseries because we didn't know how big the miniseries is going to be. And it still wasn't big. It was only four episodes, but it turned into The Wire, which was huge. And so I was like, mm. and I really wanted to do the miniseries, but but it was something you wanted to work with Denzel, too. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, damn, this is directorial debut. This movie's going to be big. He got Wood Harris. He got all these other actors that I love, you know, I want, want to work with. It's like this racial thing. Oh, man, that's going to be big. This was about drugs. 
You know what I'm saying? So you kind of wanted to get away from drugs for a minute and do something different. You know what I'm saying? And i never forget it. Robbie Reed was my manager at the time. And she came to the set and was like, it's not going to happen. I was like, what are you talking about? We was just getting ready to uh, film the episode for the studio audience that night. She was like, so they called over and said that you were, they called over from the, the corner, called over to remember the Titans and asked what position were you in. They said you was first choice. So they passed on you and went with Sean T because they needed to pick it up. You signed your contract at 8 in the morning. And they knew that. But instead of you signing your contract, then they said, oh, I failed to second choice, and they gave it to Donald Faison. So I could have did the corner and been on the wire if they would have told me that I was not second choice. Or first choice. They told me I was first choice. So we made a decision. But that was one that got away. That, that was one that got away from me. I, I wanted to do that one so bad. I cried. I was like, man, I wanted to do that. Then when I saw the success of the show, and what was crazy man, was... Funny. They never bought me back in for I never got one audition for the wire, period. After I turned it down. So that was a whole they went a whole nother four seasons and I never got I never got in to do one episode. And that's one of my favorite shows of all time. I love David Simon. He's like a beast at writing, but at the time I was young, it was, you know what I'm saying, that you trying to make the best career choice you can to you know what I'm saying, to get on and it just was it wasn't a good fit. For me, I, I missed that opportunity, but I wish I could take that one back because I would have show chose the corner. I would have show chose that one. That one would have put me on a different plateau, like, period, at that time because how big the show was. And that show's created stars. Idris Elba, Michael B. Jordan, like, a lot of cats came from that show. A lot of cats came from that show. So I was like, damn, that was one I wish I could have back. But, you know, other opportunities not. You just got to, you know, keep kicking that door and eventually a fly open. Created. Yeah, yeah, you got to create so, it. That's that's the new way. OTA, you was playing a high schooler. Like, how was that? Because you was a little bit older. So, like, how was that vibe? You know what I'm saying? I told my daughter. I told my I told my daughter because I remember one day she told me I was old, and I was like, "Baby girl, I've been playing 17 for 17 years. That ain't that crazy? Nope. Yeah, black don't crack." <laughs> so, no, nah, it was cool because. I mean, we wasn't that much older. I was like, I was in my early twenties when um, when I was playing high school. But I think we, I still had the youthful look because I didn't smoke, didn't drink, didn't do now. All I did was work out. You know what I'm saying? And back then, you know, I could eat whatever I wanted to eat because I was playing basketball six hours a day. You know what I'm saying? So I had a, I had an eight pack, and I didn't really have to do no no sit ups. <laughs> I just had to hoop. <laughs> it was like, you know, you stayed in shape just doing that so you kept the youthful look and just to deal with it it was just kind of like oh this this dope i, I actually like the show better when they went ahead five years because everybody thought the show was gonna like burn once we came back out to season four so what swan did was this was the first time it had ever been done in tv history and then we seen a lot of other shows copy us right after that because uh what was the name of the show with you know, eva longoria on it I'm trying to remember the Desperate name of the Housewives. show. Something Wives. Desperate Housewives. Okay. We went ahead five years. If you go back and look one tree from season four to season five, we graduated high school season four. Season five was four years later, like four and a half years later, or like almost five years later. And everybody was like, there's no fucking way it's going to work. You know what I'm saying? Like, how are you going to explain all the time in the middle? And we was like, we all 20 something now we drinking they smoking they doing you know what i'm saying they partying different they you know what i'm saying right now you got these high school kids they sluts <laughs> you know what i'm saying like you know what i'm saying at least if they grown and they deal with different issues and and it worked and they thought we was getting canceled after season five it worked and right after everybody else talked shit about us doing it then desperate housewives went ahead five years their next season and then other shows started doing it, like going ahead five, six years. We was like, so we, you know, we, we set a lot of trends. Yeah, we set a whole lot of trends. And then moving in from to Coach Carter, you, you briefly talked about it earlier, but one thing I, we got to know specifically is we saw in another interview, you claimed that Samuel Jackson was kind of your role model and inspiration for you getting into acting. 
What was that like working with him specifically and then like the other bigger stars on that that movie as well? Well, what's crazy was I had already worked with Sam before I did 187 with him. And so um, that's the first time I had ever met him. We did 187 and we just basically chopped it up. And He was just a cool dude. And he would like because I didn't really know how to act back then. I just was a hooper. Like, you know, what I'm saying like when I went there, I was trying to get that hundred dollars a day. You know what I'm saying? And I ended up getting an audition. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, damn, I had no idea what I was doing. So I would like not steal, but learn from the OG actors that I was around, which was Richard Roundtree. I learned something from him. Charles Dutton, I learned from him. Denzel and then Sam. And I basically just took a little piece of everything that they said to do and made it my own, made my own like style. Because Sam always said, forget the line, know the scene. And it was like, what? What you talking about? He'd be like, okay. He'd be like, okay, you come in the house. This girl is standing right there with lingerie on. That's the scene. What's the lines? I'd be like, oh, got it. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, you don't need to know the line. You live the scene. And I'd be like, okay, cool. Got it. Richard Roundtree told me, just go with your instinct. Like, you got good instinct? Go with your instinct. Denzel said, don't act. Just be. If I could tell that you acting, you suck. And I was like, but it all made sense. But me, I always like, I always compared everything to hoop. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the only way I could do it. Like, in all honesty, I think basketball players are some of the best actors that's out there because our focus is different. We know we got to be to practice. And practice started at 10, we there at 9.30. We got to be lathered up before 10 o'clock. So we there on time. We prepared. You know what I'm saying? When we go through a drill, it's us against this. Like, we not – I don't look at you as a, a mentor. I'm looking at you as a – you're an opponent. You know what I'm saying? So you better – you got to bring your game when you play against me. Like, it's the same. That's how I looked at that's, – that's how I looked at it, and I think that's how I survived in the game because, I, you know, it's a lot of hate. It's a lot of cats don't want to tell you about this audition or that. They don't want to give you the opportunity because they feel like he going to get it over you and – and I feel like if I just work hard and if it's, it got my name on it, it got my name on it. I just need to be, you know, blessed with the right opportunity to do it. And so, I mean, like I said, I just, I think the basketball players could do it. But just me acting with those guys, it was like, okay, forget the line, know the scene. Slow it down, make it you. That's what Charles Dutton said. Just slow it down, make it you. You know, don't act, just be. You know, because if I could tell you act, you suck. And, and go with your instinct. So it's like, you see what I'm saying? You use all that I mean, and you create your own style. No, those was like bars. That's kind of like, I mean, you basically just described this underdog mentality that we, you know what I'm saying, speak about on, the, uh, on our podcast. Like I was just saying, like being a basketball player, it was things that I saw, like I saw the, the, the Tim Hardaway one-two crossover and I was like, I can do that. But I'm gonna put my little flair to it. Yeah, I'm gonna use that. But I'm gonna put my little flair to it and customize it and make it mine. You know what I'm saying? I seen the Allen Iverson, the Kobe crossover. I'm like, okay, I can do that. But I'm gonna put a little bit more of this on it, and I'm gonna take a little bit of that off of it. And then now that's my move. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's just the mentality of just like customizing the things or the people that you kind of look at as. You know what I'm saying? Being that model for yourself, I think that's like the the mentality that you know what I'm saying that that's so fitting to 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 overcome and do something that's out of you know what I'm saying out of the the, the normal realm. To understand, they understand what we say. Like I'm not I'm not gonna steal Kyrie's move because I never could steal it, but I look at it and say, oh, I could use that and try to. Maybe I hezzy and spin move off that off that one leg and let me work on that. Now it's different. You know what I'm saying? That's all I did was I took a little bit from them and just created my own thing. So it's like now it's an easy focus, but I'm going to tell you what, what's scary is you have every actor has an out-of-body experience. Every actor. I don't care what character it is. like, And, and if it's something that's deep, and you had an out-of-body experience, that's when you know I could do it. And it makes you more confident. If, if if it makes any sense, it's like, 
You know what I'm saying? I have a out of you have that out of body experience where you actually become that character, and you can't shake it. You can't shake it. Like it's like, what the hell is wrong with me? You know it's something wrong with you, but you are that person still. Right. You reacting. You feel a certain way. It's crazy. Like 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 how they like how they were saying like the Tupac and Juice situation. You know, yeah. like how they were saying that, similar to that. Yeah, you become that. Yeah, he could he could become that, and it's hard to come out of that. And that's why you see a lot of actors, like a lot of the big He's actors, legend. you see they they die from like overdose, drug overdose. Because some people can't handle that. It's a different pressure. I don't know what it is. It's crazy, but it's a feeling that your body get. You have to literally go away from people and like let your body just come back to what you were. Like, but now I can control it. But at first, if you can't control a lot of actors, once they have it, they can't control it. And a lot of them don't get it until later in their careers. You know what I'm saying? When they focus. But that what that's what really made me know that I could do this. I was like, damn, I could really do this. I'm not nervous no more. I'm not this. I could do this. I was like, bet, hell yeah. You know what I'm saying? And then I just, and like I said, I incorporated everybody else's style to make my own style. You know what I'm saying? See, like a lot of people don't really study the actors. If you ever go watch Denzel, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to trip you out real quick. Go watch Denzel when he does certain scenes. He does this in every certain scene. He kissed his hand, and he touched something. When he's talking, he never blinks. So if he having a conversation with somebody, he never blinks because his thing is whoever blinks the first, whoever blinks the first loses. So he never blinks. And you'd be like, I never paid attention to that. So I would go back and watch and I said, damn, he really taking over the scenes because he's not blinking. And they can't handle it. Like he's having a stare down in the scene and he's not blinking. And I was like, that's so cold. So you have to like, you know what I'm saying? You have to watch that stuff to you watch it different when you on that. You know what I'm saying? You see it just like you see the game different. You know what I'm saying? You look at footwork, you look at this, you look at that. It's just like all incorporated. But I look at everything in the acting world as hoop. Period. Cause there's a big similarity. Like yeah. I'll say, for example, like when you in the league, you need to know this play ahead. If you don't know this one play, you could be fired. Just like if you Come in there and learn that line. You could be fired just like that. Just like that, yep. Mm -hmm. And and that, that's where you got to add an IQ. So you got to add an IQ on the court, and you got to add an IQ in the in the acting game because you, you don't know. But you, I had to learn it. You know what I'm saying? I had to learn it, and it took me a while to learn it. But like I said, once I finally got it down, then now it's, it's not work no more. I go to the set. I'm super confident. I know, you know, let me read this. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we do that. Boom. And then I know I can put my little spin on it. And, and it's going to make it, you know what I'm saying? It's going to make it believable to where they like, oh, damn, here come this dude again. You know, I know him. I know him. They don't know what, what I'm capable <laughs> of doing. They don't know which way I'm going to go. And that's what you want. You want to keep people on their toes with it. You know what I'm saying? So it ends up being... Like a good mesh, but that's why. Like I, when when we did the show, I did the thing with Miko, and she was like, "Bro, I'm not an actress. I don't, I just got some money, and I'm trying to put it behind this idea that I got." And I'm like, "You can do it." Yeah. And she she was studying her lines, and she knew her lines, and she knew her lines, and I was like, "Okay." Then I took the script away from her, and I started saying other stuff, and she would respond like. I said, I'm going to just say whatever I say. Don't worry about what I say. Just when I stop talking, I just want you to list, just listen to what I'm telling you and respond. And then she was like, wait, hold on. And the whole attitude switched up everything. I said, because we wasn't acting. We was just being. So you're giving me natural responses. So yeah. now I believe you. When you're acting, I don't believe you. It sounds like you're reading off the paper. So when I had to break it down... Yeah, I broke it in hoop uh, terms though. for it. Then when I broke it in hoop terms for it, then she understood totally what I was saying and was like, mm -hmm. okay, got it. And then we did the, the yeah. take, and it was like, that's what we're looking for. I was like, see, you got to have somebody that knows how to pull it out of you. Yeah. 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 Shout out to Miko, too. She, like, first off, she's a hooper for sure. She's very active on the, on the hooper thing. 
but she did some uh she did some commentating she did some like some journaling stuff for the big three too so now she definitely is a character she got her own little personality she's funny as all as all get out too so. yeah that girl's crazy yeah, I love me, I'm, I'm gonna be i'm gonna be yeah i'm gonna be looking forward to that too what you say that was called again it's called ho h-o-e uh-huh. happiness uh-huh. over everything it's about a, a cheating wife so she she named it. Oh, so I, I gotta, see you got a sense of humor that's just <laughs> unheard of. Right. She said, right "Yes, I'm gonna be a host." Straightforward. Yeah. Straightforward. I forget. On on the set, did Samuel Jackson ever hit you with the MF? Oh yeah. How many Man, times did he say it on set? If if I had a cuss jar, it'd be full. <laughs> that's that's how many times he did. That's just that's just him. That's Uncle Sammy. That's how he get down. Yep. But he's to the point, though. No, you know what? I'll tell you the funniest story. So me and Sam was on set one day, right? And I, this one, Ashanti had just came. So, you know, Ashanti, she's new to acting and stuff like that at the time. And, you know, a lot of times when they come from the singing world or, the you know, that world, it's 10 bodyguards. They're walking you through. They Everybody move. And, you know what I'm saying? Like, but we was on set, and it was just us. It wasn't no no extras that there was just us in the cast. It was just like the cast and maybe a few extras in one scene. So me and Sam, we was in his trailer watching the Spurs because the Spurs was playing the Pistons. It was the uh, the NBA Finals. And the Spurs, so we was like, I ain't had no TV like his in his trailer. He had the decked out trailer. I had the little regular honey wagon. You know what I'm saying? So I'm over at his trailer watching the watching the game. And so we we hear start hearing all this ruckus. Like, what the hell going on? So we walk outside and it's Ashanti and her mom. They walking. They got like five or six big ass security guards surrounding her with these black shirts, like they was walking her through the tunnel at the concert. You know what I'm saying? So we was like. What they like? They tripping it. It's just us on set today. And uh, Sam said, "What the fuck? Look at this motherfucker! Hold on." He grabbed the script and he looked. He said, "What number am I on the call sheet?" I said, "Number one." He said, "What number are you?" I said, "Number two. He said, "I guess we ain't shit." Come on, let's go to set. <laughs> we started walking, but we didn't have no security. <laughs> we just was walking. <laughs> we was cracking up. I was like, "Sam is crazy as hell." But we, you know, it ain't, it wasn't her fault. She don't know. She was brand new to the set. You know what I'm saying? And she don't know. We had fans, but I ain't gonna lie. We used to have fans when they found out Ashanti was working. Shit, it was spectators. They would line the streets up just to get a glimpse of her when we was filming in Long Beach. I was like, damn. Yeah, she had a following. Sean had a following. We didn't have that following. We just was like, oh, they filming a the movie. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but when she came, shit, it was different. I promise you that it was different. But that's one of the, like I said, that's one of the best times I ever had filming any movie. Was uh was was Coach Carter because Sunset Park was fun too, but it was my very first anything. Yeah, it was my very first, so it was like I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't know how to handle celebrity. Because being a high school basketball celebrity is different than being a you on TV and everybody know you. Yeah. Everybody coming up to you. Oh, dude, you the dude. And you like, what up? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's weird to me because even at the Drew League, they praise a lot of celebrities now. Like, you know what I'm saying? They sit courtside, nothing. They won't even give me a courtside seat because I'm just... I'm just Drano. That's what they call me. Yeah. George George nicknamed me Drano years ago. So I'm just Drano. So when I come, they forget that I done did all these movies and stuff. They like, oh yeah, that's oh that's Twan. That's Drano, man. He good. They, hey Drano, could you move so the celebrities could sit down? I'll be like, What? <laughs> you know what I'm like, it's so weird. So, but like I said, I, I'm family, so they don't look at me like that. You know what I'm saying? Like Unless they see me on TV, they'd be like, oh, that's my boy. Hold on, let me call him. You know what I'm saying? Because it's, it's just different. I don't know. It's, it's just different up there. Yeah. yeah. How do you, how do you uh, feel about, uh, like, Coach Carter's impact on the world, the culture, the basketball community, and everything like that? Like, I know you briefly spoke about it a little bit, but, like, looking back on it now, 
just the effect on Coach Carter um, and his iconic uh, appeal that it's had. I think it has a lot of appeal for for one reason, education, because that's what he was big on, education. You are a student athlete. Student comes first. And a lot of cats, you know, now it's just if I got game and I got the marketability, I could go straight to the league. But what these young cats don't understand is you got to sign a contract. Yep. And you got to know what that contract say because that could be the difference in you making 10000 and 100000 You know what I'm saying? Some You signing away your rights because you don't know how to read. But so your the English, the, everybody always, like I always preach to my kids, it's the reason why English and math is the main two subjects. It's the reason why, because you need to understand how to get paid. You see what I'm saying? So you read this stuff to get your check. That's the math. That's the English portion. That's the math portion. Because at a certain point, you're not a you're not a businessman. You're a business. You're the business man. Yeah, you're the businessman. You are the business. <laughs> you are a boss. You are a CEO. Z. You don't work for your agent. You don't work for your lawyer. You don't work for them. They work for you. They're your employees. But if you don't know how to run a company. You don't, because you don't have the education and that, and run yourself. that makes it so. that makes it worse for you. So like how how are you gonna be able to get paid? It don't make no sense. And you know, I like I said, I tell my kids that all the time because you the boss. You you I want I wanna I can't stand my boss. Well be the be the boss. Boss yeah, be the boss. You can create this, you can make this, but you have to run your company a certain way in order for you to be successful. And that's it. So Coach Carter definitely hit home with the student athlete. And then he did it in a certain way where he was like, oh, we got one player that's ineligible. And normally Cats is just like, yeah, man, he can't play today. He like, no, we can't play today. I'm holding everybody accountable for him not being uh for him not being it because y'all his teammates. So you can't play either. So you better get in his ass and make him take accountability. For, for fucking up in school and making sure he get it right. And once he get it right, then we all could play again. And it was like, damn. So he made you come together. And he and I know the real Coach Carter. And and that dude is real. Like, he a country dude. But he one of those country dudes with the values and the family and the one fail, everybody. And he, and he, made, and he made sure everybody, like, he made sure everybody pushed each other. And we wasn't playing another game until everybody was eligible. Cause he cared about that. You know, and, and, and he really liked that that line about the stats, you know, that was in the movie when he was like, since everybody likes stats, look to your left, look to your right. One of you is gonna get arrested, one of you is going to prison. Yeah, that's the stats for this area. Since y'all wanna know about did I had twenty and ten, no, that's the stats. One of y'all going to jail in the next two years. Now that's the eighty percent chance of that. That's to this. And it was like, damn. And it hit home. It did hit home because I never really looked at it like that either. Until when I did the movie and it made you open your eyes to some of it like, wow. But then you look back and be like, damn, if I had a high school program, I might do that too. Make sure everybody's held accountable for each other. And then you have a better season because everybody like each other. Everybody more like a family. Everybody want to see each other win. It ain't like, oh, he done, he done hit three shots in the road. Let me get mine on. Me, if he hit three, he going to hit three more. I don't need to shoot. I'm going to milk him. You know what I'm saying? I, don't None of us need to touch the ball if he hot. And that's how, you know what I'm saying? And that's how he built that camaraderie between everybody. So I think that touched a lot of issues. And that's why a lot of people, like, I know high school coaches and college coaches, they come up to me now and be like, hey, man, that was an inspiration for my kids. My, I coach a JV team and. We watched that movie and da, 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 and I'm like, damn, that's dope. They make you feel good, like you did some. You know, I'm saying I helped portray a message for the student athletes of the world. So, in filming the basketball scenes for Coach Carter, was it any different compared to filming the basketball scenes for One Tree Hill? How would you compare them? You know, it was the same people. So, um, it was called Real Sports, and they wanted everything as authentic as possible. They did Coach Carter because they did want to have to hire stunt doubles. So when they was doing it, they was like, look, 
we had a month of basketball training before we started filming. And Coach Ellis, when you would get to, like, I never forget it. I'm, I'm, I don't already play basketball professionally everywhere. So now I, I'm, I'm like, I'm doing this movie, it's acting, boom. I pulled up, I couldn't park outside or something. And like, like I said, normally I would be 30 minutes early for regular practice on any team. This day it was like practice was at noon. I think I got to the gym at like 11.55 and couldn't find parking. And I walk in the gym at like 12.03. I'm getting dressed and now I'm ready. And then I know I'm the better basketball player here anyway because uh, they, they're actors. But we did ask some, some players there. And he was like, as soon as I got dressed, he was like, okay, you done, Mr. Worm? You ready? He was like, okay, cool. It's 12.10. Everybody on the line. 10 suicides. Time, 28 seconds. Yeah, Mr. Worm want to be late for practice? Then we going to run for Mr. Worm. That's how we going to do it. I was like, what the? It was like I was back in college. I was like, hey, hold on. And that dude ran the hell out of us. We had real practice every day for two hours, like every day. If one person was late, everybody paid for it. If this was late, like everybody paid for everybody's mistake. Everybody paid for it. So it was like, he was like, no, when people see this movie, they're going to see the authentic, the authenticity of this movie. They wanted to see us. They was, he was like, this movie is going to be real, period. And it was because he really, like, everybody was like, did you do all the pushups? Man, listen, we did a lot of pushups. We did a lot of sit-ups, a <laughs> lot of crunches, a lot of running because that dude, he was like, no, this is what it is. He never called us by our regular name after that day. Your name is your character. He called us only by our character name, period. I was worm for the next four months. That, 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 that they could they never called me Antoine. I was worm for four months. <laughs> So it was like crazy, but he made it real to where when we put it, when they put it on camera, that's what it was. And and it was it's the same exact people that were in real sports that did all this, the um the coordination and stuff like that for One Tree Hill. But I I didn't think he was because he was a little bit more lenient on One Tree Hill than he was on Coach Carter. I guess because it was a big movie, and the movies was what's popping. At the time, the TV shows, you could still go cut them scenes and go to the drama of who's sleeping with somebody's boyfriend. And then, you know what I'm saying? And they could cut that out. But And Coach Carter, it was basketball. That was it. This need to be said how it need to be said. And that was that. And that's why. Right. So he, like, flipped the switch. So Coach Carter was way more intense basketball-wise than, than One Tree Hill, for sure. And Sunset Park was just... The director work, wanted to work with us so bad. The director was like, so what are you guys going to do? We was like, well, we know all the plays. We practiced for a month. Let's just play. So they would call it indie. They would be like, we're going to do independent now. And they would set up like five or six cameras all over the arena. Behind the backboard, all the, they would set all the cameras up. And we would, they would put time on the clock, and we would play for like 20 minutes. And whatever they got, they got. And then they put it in the movie. So nothing was choreographed. Everything, we actually came down and had to run sets, see who was getting buckets, who wasn't getting buckets. Nothing. We just had to play. We played through fouls and everything. And they, they edited it. That. That's why that's why Sunset Park is just real. Because we just actually was hooping. You know, they choreographed a couple things they had to, like the block at the end of the movie. and You know what I'm saying? And stuff like that. But... For the most part, it was called indie play, and we did indie play a lot, and they got what they got. But real sports, they do a lot of indie play, but when they set those plays up, they don't want nothing looking phony. Like, it's got to be precise. Like, the footwork, when you dribble, 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 you stutter step, you plant, you spin move, you fade away. If they didn't block it, they didn't block it, and that's, you know, that's how it went on that set. And it went like that all the time. And they was looking for basketball players. So Kenny Jackson, you know, Action and Bobby Jones and all of them cats. I I had everybody come. I was like, look, I know a bunch of hoopers. I'm, I had a game this weekend. I'm going to just tell all of them to come up there and they could get this money. You know, they're my homies. And I know they could play. But they're not coming to act. They're coming to hoop. 
<laughs> like, period. Half the Drew League at the time, Chip, everybody. If you go back and look at like that that tournament that we played oh. in on the set, oh. you're gonna see all the face. You're gonna see a lot of faces you know from Drew, because I invited all of them to the set to come get the money. So and they all came. They all came to the set and got that money. So that was the set because anytime they yelled cut, we was all going at each other. So it was like that was the, the more like the most competitive competitive set right there was Coach Carter for sure. And then that next year, 2004, the team that we put in Coach Carter won a championship at Drew. Nova Stars won a championship that year. First first team ever in the history of Drew to come in the first year and win a chip. And we beat problems in the championship. And it was all the cats from Drew that we just assembled a team, and they just like playing with each other. So we put the team in the next season and, and won a Drew championship. <laughs> That's when we was – it was Adidas was the sponsor at the time. I still got the, the uh, light blue. Remember the light blue yeah. and uh, North Carolina blue and white reversible jerseys? The, the Adidas joints, I still got them joints. All right, so we'll start wrapping this episode yeah. up. We end each episode with three specific segments. Uh, we'll get into the first one, which was named Give a Dog a Bone segment. It's basically a couple rapid-fire questions for you to answer just so our listeners can get to know you a little bit better. Um First one we start off with with the Underdogs podcast. We got to know what your favorite dog breed is. I like uh, blue nose pit bulls. Favorite musical artist? I got a lot of favorite artists, but one of my favorite is my my Chicago homie Twister. I can't, I, you know, I can't, I, I can't uh, run on Twister. That's my dog. Right. In a fantasy world, Tree Hill Ravens versus Richmond Oilers. Who's winning? Oh. I'm at the road with the with the Oilers. Okay. Also in this fantasy world, skills versus Worm one on one. Who you taking? I'm taking Worm. Worm would probably dog him because they was from the ghetto. <laughs> he, got, he got a little bit more dog in him than, than skills. Skills grill, you know. He was by the beach. <laughs> they was playing beer pong. <laughs> worm, worm ain't never heard of beer pong. <laughs> Hey, Rome, 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 Rome going to shoot some dice. Hey. <laughs> Do you have a favorite actor or actress? Samuel had to be my top. MJ or LeBron? MJ, for sure, easy. Nike or Adidas? Nike. Chicago or LA? Chat town all day long. That's where I'm from. Favorite, favorite current player? Favorite current right now? <laughs> oh, it's, it's, I'm about to go with KD. I'm about to go with KD or Kyrie, one of them. Cause I ain't, well, can't nobody go. I love Steph, too. So, I don't know. It's it's a few out here. But I love Steph. <laughs> Steph, Steph more like, like I play. That's I, I like Steph because he play like I play. I'm a shooter. So. Okay. <laughs> Well, who you like? I, I, I'm going to tell you why I like Mike better than LeBron. Okay, now I got a bunch of these. I'm from Chicago, so I'm going to be they, – they think I'm going to just be biased, but I'm not. I had a young kid that asked me last week. He was like, so you think – because you older, so I'm assuming that you think Mike Michael Jordan is better than LeBron. I said, yes. And he was like, well, why? I said, let me ask you a question. If you got to guard LeBron, what are you going to let him do? Oh, I'm going to let him shoot. Cool. If you had a guard, Mike, what you going to let him do? You can't let him shoot. You can't let him post you. You can't stop. So you you already told me a weakness. I'm living with that three. If you making it that day, I'm supposed to lose. But I'm not about to let you come down the lane and just and just lay me and bully me. No. But if, if you hit that, cool. We supposed to lose. I'm rolling with that. But Mike, you couldn't get him an open three. You couldn't get him a mid-range. You couldn't give him a post. Like, you can't send him to the line. You could send LeBron to the line. He going to trick some free throws. He going to trick some. Mike, 80 some percent. He ain't missing none of that. So that's why I got Mike and then I got Cole. Because with, but you got to pick your poison. What, it, what weakness do they have? And on top of that, they going to lock you up 94 feet the rest of the game. They want to guard the best player. LeBron, when they play in the finals, he didn't guard Steph, 
He didn't guard Clay. He guarded Draymond. He guarded somebody else. He guarded Pascal. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you running from them. You running from them. When Cole played y'all, Cole wanted to guard you. He didn't want to guard nobody else. Mike want to guard you. He want to guard Carl Malone. He want to guard, you know what I'm saying? He want to guard whoever it is that's killing. And then he'll go to hold his 30 for me, too. So that's why I got to go. It's that competitiveness. Yeah, I got to go. I got to go them one, two, and then LeBron three. I, I got to go with that. All right, well, today is January 18th. We got to write this down, podcast history. Antoine Tanner just defeated the LeBron versus MJ argument. Yeah. It's over after that one. Yeah, you can't. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you shoot. What else? Okay, beat me. <laughs> beat me. I can't stop none of the other stuff you got. <laughs> but the shot, yeah. You got to work on that. I'm cool. I'm living with that three. So would you say MJ is probably your favorite all-time player as well? That was going to be the next one. Yes. And I'm only going with Kobe second is because Kobe mimicked him. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Kobe said, "I'm gonna, uh, if can't nobody guard that, then I'm going to do that. And he and he studied it to the T. What is your favorite role that you've played? I would say, I would say skills. I would say skills because he had a lot of a lot of shades when he got to work with the kids and then he worked with the, you know what I'm saying? I was the friend who came in and gave you a motivational speech when you needed it. And and then uh, I was the uncle and, you know, he had a lot of different shades to him. You know, Worm, when you do movies, you only that character for a little bit, but I was skills the longest. You see, I was skills nine years. I was Worm for four months. You know what I'm saying? So, I would have to say, I would have to say, skills for sure. Yeah, skills definitely brought the comedic relief to that show too. So that was appreciated. Yeah, every, uh, everybody was is, dying, and he made somebody laugh. It was, <laughs> it was like, here comes skills. What is a dream role you would love to land one day? I want to get a, a Denzel or you know Sam type role, like how, how Sam was in the. I mean, or um, Denzel was in the. What's the name of the movie? Like. Eli, Book of Eli, where he was like the dude who come like save everything and in that in that realm where he just is nothing out there and he's going just into the unknown and figures everything out. Like I kinda wanna do that. I think that focus would be way different for me. Okay. So that's gonna do it for this segment. I'm gonna pass over to Mike for the next one. Yo. Okay, so I got this uh I got this segment to where I kind of dive into the, the microwave versus like the oven theory, you know. Uh, you know, since we was kind of talking about it a little bit uh, previously on the on the pod, to where you know we were just talking about the social media era and just like how highlights is that like that microwavable, instant gratification type of feel, but that oven process that's more that that underdog walk to where you gotta like season it, you gotta wait for it to get in that oven and. You know what I'm saying? Properly be of temperature. So I got a few questions that I like to just, you know what I'm saying, throw at you. You know what I'm saying? And just see your opinion. So I got the, the 2000s NBA versus right now NBA. This this NBA right now is a little bit more exciting just because of the players. You know what I'm saying? Like what they capable of is like a new it's a new generation. Like Steph and them made the game different. The 2000 era was more physical. It was way more physical, you know, because you can't do like, you know, jump on, you know, you can't run under catch. You can't do this. You know what I'm saying? You can, you can, you can't hand check. You can't back then you could do all that. You know, now, now you can't, they barely touch you. you they shooting 12, 13 free throws and the game, they, the scoring, they done made the game faster. So I would have to say that this NBA is a lot more exciting, but I think the the 2000 era was more authentic. If that makes sense. So going into um, uh, One Street Hill, would you rather have uh, Nathan's confidence or Luca's skill? Um, uh, probably the confidence, because most of the game is confident. You know what I'm saying? It's confidence. So I would probably want to have his confidence for sure. But they both went through a lot on the show. Right. They went. They both went through a whole lot on the show with the heart, with the heart problems and the this and. Him just going into depression, not making it, and having to go a different route. He couldn't go D1. He had to go NAIA. He had to go, you know what I'm saying? So they both went through their they own little things. But having that confidence, I would probably take that confidence because he 
he he overcame a whole bunch of stuff that was in the basketball world that he kept being a failure at. All right, last one I got in my stake. Would you take Coach Carter's uh, ability to own the moment or yourself as a Drew Lee player coach? Um, <laughs> who? That's the tough one because I done been both. <laughs> I done been a Drew Lee player coach for years. Um. Yeah. I would probably take his. I would probably take the moment. I would probably take the moment, but just because he he impacted more people than I have as a Drew League player coach, because I only got twelve every year. You know what I'm saying? He impacted the world with one movie. His statement got out. You know what I'm saying? I still deal with knuckleheads. Some want to listen, some don't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you like your teammate is open. You could have passed it and cut and got the ball right back. Yeah, but I still made the layup. Yeah, but you had the Euro step to make the layup, and he was wide open. You kick it and cut, and you get the ball right back. Like, yeah, so definitely Coach Carter for sure. <laughs> All right, so I got I got my segment called Overrated, and is scenario we always do two different since you played basketball and right. We can give you one to see which one you know. Which one would you prefer? Would you rather have a 17-year acting career and an award-winning blockbuster as one of the main stars, right? Or a 12-year NBA career being a six-time All-Star with three NBA? Because I was always small, and I remember when I played in the Vegas in the pro and in, in the summer pro league. And they'd be like, Shorty balling, Shorty balling, but Shorty never got a contract because Shorty never had the politics to back him. You know what I'm saying? Even though I was decent, I kept getting overlooked. Like, now nah, we'll send him, to, we, let's just send him to France. No, let's send him to Korea. Or let's, let's send him to an affiliate. But I would have loved to play in the NBA for at least one game. I would have loved to do it. I can't do it now, but you know what I'm saying? I, I probably could walk on the court, but. I don't know how good I'll be. Cause they, they, the game is fast. <laughs> game is fast. <laughs> so, in this question, man, if you did went went to them camps instead of them pushing you overseas, if they told you to go to the D League, I would have went. But I had a politics. Like, that's when I learned that it was it was it was political actors. They know us, but we don't make as much money as the producers or the directors. Wow. And that's the crazy part. He is, but everybody want to take a picture with me. That's the crazy part. So, yeah, definitely the lead for me. <laughs> Count me in. All right. Final question. We end every single one of our episodes with this question. What is the biggest lesson you learned throughout your entire journey so far? Okay, the biggest lesson that I have is treat everybody the same. Executive producer, down to the extra. Treat everybody the same because you never know what that person is going to be. I, I remember when I did when I did Sunset Park, this dude Mark, I think it's that Mark Jackson. Actually, his name was Mark Jackson. He was a um, he was a PA at the time. He used to run and get food for us and coffee and juice. He was basically like you know like a slave on set, basically trying to get his feet wet. He ended up being one of the biggest directors in Hollywood. And the girl that was on Megan, Megan, she was on um, Coach Carter. She was an assistant. She was the producer's assistant where she got coffee. She ended up being my boss on Black Jesus. She ended up being the executive producer of Black Jesus. So you never know what they're going to be. So treat everybody the same. You know what I'm saying? Like treat everybody with their respect in the game and, and, and it'll fall, it it'll follow you, trust me. Because when I walked in and seen her, she's like, I loved Antoine. He was so nice on the set of Coach Carter. He wasn't mean and da-da-da-da. Hired immediately. They go a long way.